Welcome to the Financial Freedom Academy Live. This is our special year-end tax edition. I think we've been doing this now for a few years. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And we've got a special guest, our longtime friend, Tom Wheelwright, of course, the amazing author of the Page Turning Book, and it's more relevant now than ever before, Tax-Free Wealth. He's a rich dad advisor, founder of WealthAbility. Um, you gotta go check out his book, Tax-Free Wealth. Put it under the tree this year for someone yes. in your family, or have tell someone else in your family, hey, buy this book for me, I wanna read it and learn about how to build massive wealth by permanently lowering my taxes. And another thing you can do as well, you're wrapping presents, is download Tom's WealthAbility podcast. That's exactly what I do. And um, I refresh your feed like crazy, Tom, because you're killing it during the pandemic. It's the only thing that makes sense of the world right now. It is true. She's like, you got to listen to Tom's episode because, oh my gosh, we need to do this. We need to do this. Tom, yes. welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks so much for having me. You guys are amazing. Um, actually, just just uh, record a new podcast this morning. It was It was terrific. I love doing this. I know you guys do too, but you guys are great at it. Well, yeah. and there's no shortage of information right now, right? I think I just want to pay you this compliment because I can tell that we all have some sort of feeling about the political climate right now, the economical climate, right? But you do a great job of not being partisan, but explaining how the political climate is affecting us all, what we can do. There's always, you know, whether or not things feel positive or not, there's always something at the end of your podcast for us to think about, for us to do. Um, and it's not about how we should feel about the misfortune of 2020. It's just about what we can do to be smart and continue to look forward. And I think you're doing a great job with that. No, I, I appreciate that. It, uh, of course, you realize I am an accountant, right? So uh, yes. we're pretty good at not being too emotional about things. It's one of our strengths. <laughs> and so, um, I, no, I, and I love just doing the analysis. You know, to me, when I get on these podcasts, I'm the student and I'm just, I'm just learning like everybody else. Yeah. Well, we've got a lot of questions today, Tom, from our viewers. Um, before the end of the year, I wanted to place this sort of a context. Of course, here we are at the beginning of December. So if you're listening to this right now live with us or in a few days, uh, these are things that you can put in place and take care of before the end of the year. But first, would you just sort of, before we get to some specific questions, maybe contextualize where we are in the tax calendar year and why this is such an important phase for all of us? So this is really a critical month right now um, in our business because we want to make sure that you want to make sure you know exactly where you stand for 2020. So you need to make sure you sit down with your accountant, you understand where you are. But there are things we can still do between now and the end of the year to reduce 2020 taxes. And there's a ton we can do if we do it between now and January 1st to get ready for next year and lowering next year's taxes. And this is an interesting year because we are changing political power in Washington. So the tax strategy or the, the tax laws we've had for the last three or four years are not a guarantee going forward. And we have no idea what 2021 will give us. Uh, but I think you said recently in your podcast, we know for sure that taxes in 2021 will not be lower. So how do <laughs> then we behave? No, that's exactly right. That is the one thing we know for sure is that taxes are not going down. Um, in the next four years. They're just not. We don't know, you know, where they'll go up or how they'll go up, but we do know that they won't go down. So we got some questions here. Let's start off with it. This one's from Chris Allen, um, longtime Financial Freedom Academy member, says, uh, how does the CARES Act affect, affect the tax strategy for 2020? So there are really uh, five big provisions in the CARES Act and really a sixth if you add in the PPP loans. Um, the PPP loans, of course, a lot of businesses, we encourage businesses to take advantage of this. And um, the, the Congress said it was uh, non-taxable and the IRS, you know, Congress giveth and the IRS taketh away. And the IRS said, maybe it's non-taxable, but that means your expenses are non-deductible. So uh, people have PPP loans that are going to be forgiven next year. The first thing they need to understand is when calculating your tax this year, don't take those deductions for the um, for your salaries, your payroll, for your rent that cause that PPP loan to be taxable. So the easy way to think of it is 
be sure that you increase your income by an amount equal to your PPP loan. And that's probably a safe bet. Now, will they change that next year? We hope, but we don't know. That is the law this year. So that would be number one. Um, just don't ignore that, that, that PPP loan. Think of it as a taxable amount of money in 2020. Um, second of all, we had huge tax benefits in the CARES Act, uh, really five big ones. We had um, net operating loss carrybacks. We had qualified improvement property, which is basically if you made tenant improvements in a commercial building over the last three years, you get to deduct those um, either this year or the year you made them, you get to choose. I mean, lots of benefits there for anybody who did any kind of tenant improvements uh, for their business. Uh, we have uh, an elimination of the $500,000 loss limitation. And I know that's a little technical, but if you combine that with the net operating loss carryback, which we can carry back now five years for 18, 19, and 20, uh, you basically can free up a whole lot of cash if you have or can create a net operating loss this year. Uh, remember, net operating losses next year can only be carried forward. So you want to make sure that if you're if you're in a loss position, you want to maximize that loss this year. Uh, it's a, kind of an odd situation. Um, another one is um, the hundred thousand dollars, and this is a big one for I think for um, everybody on this call is that if you had a any kind of direct effect consequence of COVID, um, either you had COVID, a family member had COVID, you um, you had reduced work hours, your business reduced work hours. You know, there's a number of factors. If you if you had this effect, then you can withdraw $100,000 combined from your IRAs, 401ks, pension plans, and uh, choose either not pay tax this year or, and then pay it back within the next couple of years, or you can just pick it up in income, a third, a third, a third in 2020, 2021, 2022. That is it. Really, getting $100,000 out penalty free and tax reduced is a huge, huge, huge benefit um, that people should not ignore. And you can still do it between now and the end of the year, but it has to be done by the end of the year. So that's something people ought to be acting on right now. And then the last one is actually, I think, a very important one, which is they took off the cap on charitable deductions uh, if you make cash uh, contributions. So you can literally donate 100% of your income this year. Wow. And uh, take the full deduction and not pay any tax at all. Wow. That's a big one. That's a big one. Um, yeah. Wow. That's some big changes. So please, I hope people are paying attention. Rewind this. Go back and write these down. These are some really important things you need to talk with your, your CPA about. Right. Um, these are questions that have an expiration date, though, because once January 1st hits... There's nothing you can do. Right. So be asking these questions. Um, the next question we have is something I think we ask you all the time because it's it's such a big one, but hard to get your head around. It revolves around being a real estate professional. Obviously, people want to know this because they want that unlimited loss to carry over into other parts of their income. So can you go over one more time how you qualify to be a real estate professional and why this is such a burning question for entrepreneurial people. All right, so, so let's start with the big picture. So the general rule is rental real estate losses, losses from rental, which you get because of bonus depreciation, right? Not because you actually have cash losses, but you actually have losses because of the depreciation rules. Or a rehab or a turnover or some-, well, some Or right, a rehab, a turnover, right. anything like that. All those expenses, right. So those are not, that loss is not deductible against other income as a general rule. It's only deductible against other passive income. So that's the general rule. So what do we want to do? We'd like to, like you said, Natalie, we want to free up those losses to be able to offset wages and business income, um, you know, uh, royalty income, other types of income that they wouldn't normally be able to offset. And we, I call it the get out of jail free card is being a real estate professional. Because if you qualify as a real estate professional, then all of those losses become available to you. All of your real estate losses. And even, even if you have some real estate losses from, for example, syndicated investments, in addition to your own properties, okay? Even those can be freed up. So it's a really big deal. Now, it's actually a really simple computation really, really simple. And it doesn't have anything to do with whether you have a, a broker's license or a real estate license. That's not a requirement here. What's required is 
that you spend more than 750 hours a year in real estate and or a real estate business that can include construction, uh, could include property management, could include your own rental properties, all sorts of things qualify. And you spend more time in real estate than all your other business activities combined, including your job. Okay, that's it. That's all you have to do. Now, you have to prove it. Okay, <laughs> as, as I was talking to a client this morning in, in the US on tax deductions, you are guilty until proven innocent. Okay, yeah. this is not, you, the IRS doesn't have to prove that you're wrong. You have to prove that you're right. And so it's very important that you keep good records and keep a, a regular log of your hours, what you're doing, uh, who you're doing it with, what the, what the benefit is. I mean, as much detail as you can get, because if the auditor comes knocking, I guarantee you, they will ask for those records. What are yeah. some big pitfalls that you've seen with this, Tom? Like. You know, I mean, okay, well, I spend a certain amount of time like listening to your podcast, right? The Wealth Ability podcast or listening to our podcast, the Investing in Real Estate podcast, sitting there taking notes, um, studying properties. Like, what are some pitfalls, though, that people should avoid with that that maybe would be, might be a red flag for an IRS auditor? Well, I, I think, first of all, don't, don't, don't rely on 750 hours, okay? Make, <laughs> there make is sure not that much wealth ability. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make sure it's 850 or 900 hours. Okay. I mean, seriously, you want, you don't want to be close. You don't want the IRS agent to be able to say, oh, well, if I disallow three hours, um, it, you know, right. it's, it's kind of like you, you don't want to vote to be close, right? Because you don't want a, a, a few, a few votes one way or the other to, to make the difference in the election. The same thing is true with this election, which is the real estate professional election. You don't want that to happen. Another one is, is there's actually an election you must, speaking of elections, there's an election you must make on your tax return. And that is an election that your accountant has to make. It's to, you basically combine all of your real estate properties and consider it a single business activity. That's kind of the generic way of saying it. Um, there's a very technical uh, wording that you have to use. If you don't make that election, you're not going to qualify. Okay. So th that's a rather big deal. Um, we've had court cases where they didn't make the election and they lost the court case, even though they met all the other tests because they didn't make that election. So oh, that's wow. a big pitfall that you really have to make sure you need to check it. Don't, don't just rely on your accountant. Okay. Just make sure that you look for that election, say, and ask your account, where's this election? I like to make it every year. Okay, because even though you're supposed to only have to make it once and it's good forever, I don't want you don't want to have to go back 10 years and prove that you made an election 10 years ago. Just make it every year. There's no downside to that. So um, it's it's pretty simple to do, but it's frequently missed. Yeah, my mom, she just keeps a little like notebook and she writes in her hours because and that's just Perfect. in case anyone comes knocking you know she doesn't have to actually give it to her accountant she just has to have it at the ready yeah so. we actually prepare every tax return as if it's going to be audited because why not be ready for it right right yeah right and that's what you know the great team at WealthAbility teaches you to do and tom has taught us to do is like you know you get a receipt out of the atm you for whatever reason write a note on it so you've got very detailed notes. And then that way you can refer back to that lunch meeting and have a note on there. We talked about X, right. Y, and Z real estate transaction for this and that yeah. and all of it's written down, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We got some other good questions here. All right, here, um, this one, when rehabbing a property, this one is from Chris, uh, how long do we have to hold it in our LLC before we can sell it as a long-term capital gains event? When rehabbing a property, how long do we have to hold it in our LLC before we can sell it as a long-term capital gains event? So that's actually a, a trickier than you might think. Um, the general rule is you have to hold it a year and a day. Okay, so that's what long-term capital gains is. However, you can't be in the business of buying, rehabbing, and selling properties, even if you hold them for five years. Okay, so this is a question that the legal term is intent. What's your intent here? Is your intent to rent it out or is your intent to sell it? If your intent to sell it is to sell it, then even there have been court cases where people have held the properties for four, five, six years and it's still treated as inventory and it's ordinary income. Hmm. So you need to show that, look, 
your your books and records, your your um, meeting minutes, right? For your shareholder meetings, your your LLC member meetings, they need to reflect that. Okay, we're we're doing this, we're rehabbing this because we're going to rent it out. Now, if you happen to a year from an, an, a year and a day later sell it, great. Okay, but you don't want to be marketing it during that year and a day, except for rent. Okay, oh. you want to wait until after that year's over and say, look, our intent was long term. Where our situation has changed, the market's changed. Now we're going to sell it. So it's not as simple as just saying a year and a day. Uh, un unfortunately, it's not. So you do have to establish that you intended to hold it for rental. Okay. Good stuff. Okay, uh, Harvey asks, what are the best tax strategies for newly formed LLCs? This is kind of a nebulous question, but are there maybe your top five or top three that you might? Well, yeah, I've seen sometimes people open an LLC and then don't have a bank account for it. Um, that's probably one. <laughs> you need a bank account per LLC. There, there, there are some very important ones. You need a bank account. You need, um, you need to make sure that you have uh, officers. You know, you need to make sure you know that you have a manager. You want it to be a manager managed LLC. General rule. Okay, you can be the manager, but you want to be a manager managed LLC. Um, you want to have a bank account. Um, you, you, if you have multiple LLCs, you want to have a holding company that's in a what I call a safe state. Okay, some states are really good for asset protection, and this is a legal question. But I'm going to tell you what my attorney friends tell me. Um, you want to be in a safe state. There are some states that are really good asset protection, some states that are really bad asset protection. Um, you know, if I can avoid my holding company being in California or Florida or Colorado, these are some states that have some bad case law. Um, other states like Texas, Arizona, um, Wyoming, Wyoming, Nevada have yeah. really good have really good case law. So, so you want to, you want to do that. Um, the other thing is, is do not under any circumstance, if you're buying this to hold for long term, do not, do not be a corporation. Okay. We don't want rental real estate. I see this mistake so many times and it's really hard to fix. Um, you do not want your rental real estate to be in a corporation. So as an LLC, right, that's not a tax. That's not a tax entity. That's just a legal entity. You have to elect how to tax that entity. You can elect to tax it as a sole proprietorship, as a partnership, as an S corporation, as a C corporation. Do not make the corporate election, okay? Under, <laughs> really, I mean, I can't think of any, really any circumstances you want to do that. Okay, so you want to be either a partnership or a sole proprietorship for tax purposes, even though you're an LLC for legal purposes. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right, so Harvey asked this question. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's another question from Harvey. How many rentals do you need to start establishing business credit? That might not be it. You know, I don't, I don't think you need a whole lot. Um, it, it, there are some credit cards. I, I, there, there are two ways I, I like establishing business credit. The first is with credit cards, okay? And there are a lot of credit card companies that they'll give you a line of credit for a brand new business, okay? So you don't need much. Uh, the second one actually is to do it with buying a car, okay? A, um, oh. That'll establish business credit better than anything. And here's the thing, you could still have it be a in your name, but use the business as the credit. Uh, um, I've done this before, and the, the advantage is, is that if it's in your name as a purchase, then you can get insurance in your name and just name the LLC as an additional insured, okay, which is way That's cheaper than commercial insurance. Uh, um, I've done it's, it's way cheaper than commercial insurance. So what, what we want to do is, um, if we can, we talk to the dealer, so this is only going to happen with you use a dealer, right? We talk to the dealer and say, well, look, I'd like a loan, but I'd like the loan in the name of the business. I'll just co-sign on it as a guarantor, but I'd oh. like the loan in the name of the business. Uh -huh. And it's a, it's a really a slick way actually to establish business credit that um, few people uh, take advantage of. Ooh, awesome. But how do you justify that as a business expense? You have to then well, say you're you, using you it. For have, you. Right. You, you, that's a different question. Okay, right. business credit is different from taking it as a business expense. 
So to get it as a business expense, the very first thing you have to have is a home office. Okay, you really need a home office because otherwise the first and last trip of the day is always gonna be personal. It's gonna be considered a commute. And so if you don't have a home office, a good portion of that car is, that vehicle is not gonna be business. It's gonna be that first and last. It doesn't matter if you go to a rental property and come home from a rental property, it's a commute unless you have yeah. a home office. Ah. So, right. you know, people give home office a bad rep, but the reality is, is that it frees up a lot more deductions uh, with your car and other expenses. Actually, I while mean, we're on- who's not? in a home office this year <laughs> everyone has exactly. to maybe that bad rap will be turned around this year well let's while we're on sorry i'm gonna do the uh, arm around in hey. the movie theater move here so it's a little more comfortable um so and i can get away with that because we're married um <laughs> so unprofessional so i gotta ask you though tom like so with this home office thing right now everyone's kind of struggling with this trying to figure out how to structure a home office how you know what's the what is the proper way to do it maybe you could just give us like an overview of the rules sure. around that so as maybe as a baseline for people right now that, that's that's a good idea um and, and especially you know we're in december so it's this is actually an important month for your home office and i'll explain why in a second so first of all it needs to be an area of your home that is used only for an office. So you can't be watching TV in there, you can't be playing video games in there, you can't be uh, sleeping in there. This is solely uh, solely business use. It doesn't have to be the whole room. It can even be half of a room, but it's gonna have to be the back half of the room, not the front half of the room, right? If it's half a room, because you don't wanna have to go through it to get to the personal side, else that's a personal use, potentially. Uh -huh. um, now, once you have it established that it is solely used for business. Then the question is, how do I actually deal with the expenses? You're gonna pay for the expenses personally, and then you're gonna submit a reimbursement request from your business, and your business is gonna reimburse you for it. That reimbursement, okay, is not gonna be taxable to you, and for the business, it's just gonna be treated as an office expense, okay? It's not rent because it's all sorts of things, it's just an office expense. So there's no way, nowhere that you're actually recording it on your tax return as a home office. As long as you're either a partnership, okay, or if, if you're a business, not rental property, an S corporation. So um, you don't, if, if you're a sole proprietor, you actually have to fill out a form on your 1040 that says, I have a home office. If you're a partnership, there's no form to fill out. You just get reimbursed by the business. So this is why even if a husband and wife form an entity, I prefer that to be taxed as a partnership um, because it just uh, hides a lot of blemishes. It's like putting makeup on in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I didn't know a lot of that about the home office. I didn't either. Yeah, I mean, I, I always have an accountant ask me very specific questions like the square footage and, you know, compared to the rest well, of the so house. And I'm like, I don't know, let me look at the floor if plan. We can, <laughs> if we can, let's talk about that just for a second because that's, that's actually a big deal. Um, there are two ways to calculate your percentage of your home that's home office. The one is what you were just mentioning, Natalie, which is square footage. So, you know, you measure, you would measure the square footage of the space and then divide it by the square in, interior square footage of the house, which most people know the interior square footage of their house. Okay, it's on your appraisal report. Um, that's one way to do it. But there is another way to do it that's allowed by the IRS, which is the number of rooms. So if you have 10 rooms in your house and one room, let's say one bedroom is used for your home office, then that's one tenth. Yeah. Typically that's gonna be more, that's gonna be a high per, higher percentage um, than if you use square footage. Yeah, oh, okay, oh. that's awesome. I have used the iPhone, um, uh, what is the measurement yeah. tool where I'm like, well, let me just see. And I'm, <laughs> that's handy now because before yeah. I was like, I don't know. You want me to measure it? Okay. <laughs> uh, I did fall asleep in my office chair one time and you're not you allowed to sleep, sleep in your there. office. Yeah. So I'm like Costanza on Seinfeld trying to sleep under my desk. And I think a lot of people do eat in their, at their desk yeah. now too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that would be normal office behavior based on my <laughs> experience with employees. So uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Just don't be playing video games. Okay, right. That should not be normal office. No, yeah. right. that's not normal. Now, Harvey already asked about the car. We already got that, but he also wanted to know about writing off trips as well. 
Like at what, at what point, point can you write travel. on the trips? So travel. Actually, I, I heard a whole bunch of people traveled over the Thanksgiving holidays. Um, <laughs> I, I don't comprehend that, but right. okay. So <laughs> Same. I, I was I was talking to um, our mutual friend, Robert Kiyosaki, yesterday. He gives me a call and he says, so are you at home? And I'm going, where else would I be? Right. right. <laughs> it's a pandemic. I don't go anywhere. Um, but if you do travel, okay, you can make it business travel. Um, in the if, if you're in the continental U.S., then business travel is um, just you just have to spend more than 50 percent of your workday doing business. And then the rest of the time you can play. You can do whatever you want. OK, and you need to keep all the regular documentation. Now, if you're traveling overseas, OK, um, and you're actually I mean, because I understand that there are actually a few countries that will let in um, Americans. Um, but many. if you're traveling overseas, if you're traveling overseas, then it's actually proportionate. So if you spend three days out of five on business, then it's 60 percent deductible. OK, oh. so it's not it's not all or nothing like it is in the U.S. Oh, interesting. Huh. huh. When I was young, my dad, he has a big real estate company and he took us to Disney World and he would book tours uh with the landscapers there like for yeah because yeah. he runs a big landscaping company and disney has all kinds of seminars for uh horticulturalists and he would take them in order to get a deduction of the trip you know it's like and then Go. my sister and i would be in classes like animation classes because my dad had to do his classes and it, it stuck with me like why is dad doing this why can't we just go on the rides and he was like this is important mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of anyone doing that before? I, I have. That's a little bit extreme, but I've talked to your dad, so don't surprise me. <laughs> so you know, you know him. You know extreme. There you go. Um, I have to watch myself there as the, yeah. the son-in-law. Um, okay, here's a great question, Tom, from Drew. Drew asks, uh, we are preparing to partner with another investor to build affordable housing. We want to lessen our tax burden as much as possible on the profit so we can buy more rental properties for ourselves. What is the best way to structure things? Any other tips to lower taxes on new construction? Yeah, so so two things. First of all, um, actually, let me give you three things. Uh, first of all, it's new construction. Um, you, it's bonus depreciation time. Okay, so you want to make sure that you do a cost segregation study oh, yeah. uh, once that is placed in service because you want the maximum bonus depreciation and you will not get that if you don't hire a professional to do a cost segregation. Okay, if you try to do it yourself, your accountant tries to do it themselves, I will guarantee you will not get as big a deduction by a long shot. Okay, you'll get less than 50% of the deduction that you would get if you hired a, 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 an engineering company to do a professional cost segregation. So that's one thing on um, that. But low income housing, by the way, has its own tax credit. So the low income housing tax credit is enormous. Oh. Um, so you're gonna wanna sit down with your uh, CPA on that low income housing credit. And if they're not at all familiar with that, please let us know, you know we'll find somebody who is, uh, because that's actually a really big deal if you're doing low income housing. And there are very specific qualifications what qualifies as low income housing? When do you get the credit? How much credit do you get? Over what period of time? What do you have to do? So, you know, you, you have to dot all your I's and cross your T's, but I'll tell you what, that is a phenomenal credit that I think people miss a lot. Um, the third thing, if, if, if you're not building from scratch, if you're rehabbing, uh, you know what? I take that back. Even if you're building from scratch, understand that any expense that an individual expense that's under $2,500, you can deduct and it's not depreciated. Now, why is this important? Because it would otherwise qualify for bonus depreciation, right? Yeah, of course. The reason it's important is because bonus depreciation, if you sell it within five years, can be recaptured. That means you're gonna have to pay ordinary income on that. But if it's a repair, there's no recapture. So actually taking the time to go through, this is something your accountant should be doing. I mean. We will have, we'll have clients that will spend, you know, 20, 30 hours going through their expense, every individual expense when they do a major rehab or new construction and breaking it down to pick up that $2,500 um, item 
because there's a lot of those. Now that doesn't mean that if you have a $10,000 bill and you pay it in four installments that that qualifies. No, it's a single item that's less than $2,500. But let me give you an example, appliances. They're all under $2,500. So all of those are deductible as repairs. So if you then sell the bill, sell, sell the project three years down the road, you don't have recapture if you took it as a repair. You would have recapture if you took it as bonus depreciation. That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah, that's really fantastic. And I should say like at our company at Morris Invest, I mean, that's what we're doing is new construction. And so we're actually doing the cost segregation ahead of time when we're doing the subdivision so that when someone closes on that property and they're buying that new construction property, they're already getting a cost segregation analysis handed wow. to them at closing. That's awesome. So they're getting- that is, that, that is an awesome service that you're doing. Thank you. And thank you. And it like it costs thousands of dollars, you know, as you know, they're not cheap to do. And so it helps right. us to do a subdivision or if we're doing 10 properties at one time to do them all at one time. And you're right on the new construction piece, Tom, that like imp road improvements. I mean, those things you get right. with new construction th that you do not get with just a rehab property, right? Well, right. I mean, there's a lot of land improvements that are subject to bonus depreciation. And it, there's a lot of things you wouldn't think of. I mean, there's wiring that is subject to bonus wow. depreciation. Mm -hmm. There's plumbing that can be subject to bonus depreciation. I mean, there's fencing and landscaping. I mean, there's all sorts of things that qualify that you think, well, this is real estate. Yeah, it is, but it's still subject to bonus depreciation. Yeah. That's great. Wow. Well, we've got one more question. Okay, from Adam, he says, I'm a firefighter and an investor. Can I reinvest my 457 without quitting my job? I'm not familiar with the 457. Is that a public service retirement account? Yeah, the 457 is like a, you know, 403B or a, or a um, it's basically a qualified plan, right? It's like an IRA, it's a savings plan. Yes. And, um, and, and so, so the question, I mean, it has all the same rules um, for withdrawal. So, you know, it's typically 59 and a half. Um, you know, um, they have, you know, every, every department's going to have their own requirements, not just the legal, the tax requirements. Um, but that's one that would qualify for the $100,000 um, exception that we were talking about at the top of the show um, for COVID. So oh. um, th there's, a, there's a place where you might be able to pull that money out, $100,000 of it, pay no penalties and uh, not pay tax, um, uh, for, you know, either, either, either put it back in three years or pay tax over three years. So you've got a choice there, but no penalties at all, even if you're under 59 and a half. And that option expires December 31st? It does. Even it though does. COVID will not be gone by then, presumably? <laughs> well, <laughs> in, in, unless we get some extension, right? Okay. So, you know, Congress is, I mean, they're constantly talking about this, uh, but the Democrats want a whole lot of money for the states. And the Republicans don't want to give it to them. Yeah. And that's the, that's the hang up right now. It, it really is. The Republicans are totally fine with giving aid to the to individuals, to aid to individual businesses. They're fine giving aid to hospitals. Um, but what they've not, what they've been very hesitant to is bailing out states. And uh, the Democrats are absolutely insistent that the states that have not managed their money as well. Uh, let me give you an example. So New York, obviously, is like billions and billions of dollars in the hole this year. Mm -hmm. Arizona, okay, where I am, Arizona has a big surplus. Okay, well, two states, what's the difference? I mean, yeah, just different populations, but why does one in the hole and why does one have a surplus? Well, it's just the management of the tax of taxpayer money, right? Yeah. So what what basically what's going on is um, it's like the idea of forgiving student loans, frankly, is that if you didn't manage your life, we're going to bail you out. If you did manage your life, well, too bad. You don't get any help. So it, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, frankly, I get where the Republicans are coming from, but I also get where the Democrats are coming from. What I don't understand is, can't you make, you know, why are you holding up individuals from getting unemployment and holding up businesses from getting additional PPP money um, that they're going to need, they may need to survive just so that you can bail out your buddies in New York and California. I don't, I don't quite understand that, but that's what's going on. Now, if, if they do ever get a bill together, I actually secretly believe that the Democrats are hoping they can win Georgia um, and the Senate, both Senate seats in Georgia, and that if they do, they can get whatever they want. 
And yeah. I think that's really what's going on with Nancy Pelosi in the House. Um, if, if that's the case, we won't see a bill until after January 5th because that's the date of the election in Georgia. If the election comes out, um, even one Republican wins, then I think we'll see a bill the next day. If, if the Democrats right. win, I think we'll see a very different bill the next day. Um, but that bill could include a couple of important things. One would be an extension of some of these tax provisions. The other thing that is written already to, to go in, that, in, in whatever bill comes out is making the expenses for the PPP loans deductible. Okay, so yeah. that's actually probably the biggest tax provision that could be in that new bill would be uh, making the PPP expenses deductible. That would have to be a special provision. Um, unfortunately, the IRS is probably right in their position right now. They're probably correct in, uh, the, in, in what they're doing. And it's just unfortunately that it was uh, poorly drafted in the CARES Act in the first place. So now they have to go back and do it. So we'll see what happens. Um, but uh, that will probably, my guess is we won't see anything before January 6th. Yeah, because if we saw Mitch McConnell just today, secretly, it's not out publicly, but the Washington Post got their handle on it, a stimulus package that he rolled out, which has no money for state and local governments, no stimulus right. checks, very little one month extension for pandemic un un unemployment assistance. So I just, I'm, it's baffling to me at this point. I mean, it's like they're just, they're not even talking on the same page at this point. So yeah, we'll have to wait, I think, until January, sadly. Yep, we will. No, oh, sad. Yeah. I want to tell you how you can get in contact with Tom and Tom's team at WealthAbility. So right here, we built this in right to our website. If you go to morrisinvest.com, right at the top, see, you got, if you go to the main page, let me just go to the main page. Let me just show you how to do this. And then right at the top there, see, there's a lower taxes tab and ready to permanently slash your taxes right there. That's how you get in contact with Tom and Tom's team. And uh, they'll cut, you can t cut taxes by 10 to 40% in three months or less. Keep those tax savings forever. So all you need to do is just fill out this and they, you will get in touch with them and book a call with Tom's team at WealthAbility and they will take amazing care of you. They're so, great. We already had our December meetings or we start in September, right? We get all our stuff together for the first three quarters mm -hmm. and then estimate what Q4 will be like. And then we start to have our conversations. And uh, well, this is wanna... just last week, we had our final one for what to expect for our tax bill and what we can do. And this year, I want to say was surprisingly painless. I did not get drunk afterwards. And uh, so that is good indication that I'm having a good time doing taxes. So it's been it's been a pretty good year. And i sorry to interrupt you there. I just wanted to say, like, you know, what's what's amazing about the team at WealthAbility is that it's and what so many other accountants don't get is that, you know, the filing of the taxes is the one thing, right? That's that's what I think people think of when they think of doing your taxes is like filing the taxes. But one of the things that Tom and Tom's team really push hard on is the idea of tax planning all year long. And so we'll be having these discussions with the WealthAbility team throughout the year, and it sets us up for success because we're already planning. I mean, talk a little bit about that before we let you go, Tom, why that's so important. Well, so here's what we've done. So I, I think what makes WealthAbility unique is that we've developed a system for reducing taxes. This isn't, you know, we don't just have the best tax planners on the planet, because I don't know that we do, frankly. We do have a system that works for everybody. So as long as all the accounts have to do is follow our system and they're gonna be successful in reducing your taxes. And so it, it really is a system that is, it's not, you know, end of the year, let's push taxes to next year. That That is, I'm sorry, but that is lazy, okay? This is about a long-term plan of action, a long-term strategy for permanently reducing your taxes. This isn't max out your 401k, max out your IRA, uh, you know, set up a pension plan. This is, let's permanently reduce your taxes and let's do it every single day for the rest of your life. But if you're doing it every single day, remember, as I always say, if you're going to reduce your tax, you have to change your facts, right? If you're going to change your tax, you have to change your facts. Well, you do that every single day. And so this is really, um, I'm very pleased to hear that you've already had your final uh, discussion, <laughs> Natalie. That's fantastic. I'm on um, it. <laughs> and, uh, and I know that the CPA that you're working with on our network is just an, an amazing, I mean, this guy cares more about his clients than just about anybody I've ever met. But on top of that, he is following the system and he follows it very carefully. 
and uh, is, is very careful not to get sidetracked and make sure and, and ma is making sure that you're doing everything possible that you can to reduce your taxes every day. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Very happy. So our thanks to you, Tom, as always, uh, we wish you a Merry Christmas, um, you and your family. Thank you so much for taking some time out here to, to hang out with our Financial Freedom Academy members and our podcast listeners to help us with this year and tax planning. It's always a real treat and an honor to, to spend time with yeah, you, my friend. It, it is. It is totally my treat and my honor. Um, you guys are amazing. Um, it's just uh, fantastic what you're doing and all the great financial education. And thank you so much. Um, for, uh, you know, doing everything that you do. I mean, you, you both gave up very successful careers so that you could serve a lot more people in a lot better way. And so really, really thank you for what oh. you're doing. That's nice of you to put it that way. Much love to you, Tom. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, my friend. Well, Merry Christmas to you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Um, be sure to check out everything at WealthAbility, right? Go to our website, morrisinvest.com. Check out, click on the Lower Your Taxes tab. Of course, check out Tom Wheelwright's book, um, Tax Free the podcast, Wealth. The, po the podcast. The WealthAbility show. We have everything in the show notes, so make sure you don't miss any of that. Uh, much love to you. Have a great uh, Christmas and a happy new year, Tom. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay safe. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight on this Financial Freedom Academy Live. We hope you found this as informative as we did. We learned um, a ton of new stuff tonight. Yes. And uh, yes. So from our family to yours. Uh oh, we got an intruder on the home office. Eve wants to say hi. You're not here. allowed in here. <laughs> yeah. You won't turn it into a home office anymore if you're in here. We can't play with you. All right. Much love to all of you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.